We're back into our look at the second epistle of the Apostle John. We've got four verses left in uh, this study, so let's pick it up in verse number 10. Of course, what John has been addressing is uh, the false teachings that had been going out. He had already addressed them in his first epistle. He continues to do so in the second one, and the, the teaching of Messiah, of course, in verse number 9. Verses number uh, 10 and 11, he continues this thought. He says, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting, for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Now, obviously, I think, you know, in, in that day and age, in that ancient world, it wasn't as if there were, you know, hotels here and there, right? It's the... The, the old uh, Motel 6 or La, La Quinta Inns and Suites, right? Uh, you did have inns, we know that, right? Uh, but as far as a, a, a number of them uh, scattered around, no, that simply wasn't the case. And so when evangelists went out and traveled from town to town preaching the word, uh, they would have to stay in people's homes. And, of course, in that day and age, it wasn't exactly like there were a lot of actual places of worship either. Uh, yes, you had synagogues. Uh, most, uh, Almost overwhelmingly, the synagogues that they had, which the Roman Empire allowed them to have in Judea uh, and various other parts, uh, of course, were not proclaiming Yeshua as the Messiah. And so those of the way... Uh, for the most part, we're meeting in homes, in people's homes, homes, uh, people that, that had large enough homes to be able to accommodate a lot of people. And so here comes John and he's saying, listen, if somebody comes to you and they don't have, and he calls it this teaching, so it's in reference to what he was speaking about before. And what is that? The teaching that Yeshua is Emmanuel. He is 100% God. He is a 100% human being. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. If someone doesn't come to you with that teaching, that he is divine and human, then John says, do not receive him into your house. Now, in other words, especially a place of worship, especially if the house is a place where those of the way were gathering. That individual that that doesn't believe who Yeshua truly is and who and who he stated he was, being the way, the truth, and the life. If somebody doesn't have that 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 idea or, or that that theology, then they have no place. They have no place teaching anything in your congregation. They have no place uh, behind a bima or in a pulpit. They, they, they have no place uh, where they should be asking uh, money of you, that you should open up your wallets and your purses and help fund them. No. No. Because they're doing the devil's work. Aiken, he comments, he says, the elder is not demanding that they refuse to engage in conversation with someone who is spiritually confused. He's not saying you cannot invite them into your home for a visit where you confront them with the claims of Christ. What he is saying is that we are not to provide support and aid. Take, for instance, a place to stay and money to anyone who is spreading false teaching and disseminating error. End quote. Don't even receive them. Not only that, he says, do not give them a greeting. Don't greet these false teachers, these false prophets, as if they're one of us when they're not. They're not one of us. They're doing the devil's work. They're not one of the brethren. Don't, don't let them in your house, and don't give them a greeting. Uh, now, listen, unbelievers, unbelievers, who want to hear the truth, who desire to hear the truth, whether they, they, they heard a, a sermon maybe on television, or somebody gave them a tract, or, or a book, or, a t or on the internet, and now they come to you and they say, listen, I, 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 I want to know more about this Jesus. 
I want, I want to know more about his, his sacrifice on the cross. Please help me to understand. Give me more information. That by all means, that's what we do. We ought to welcome that opportunity. And we give them the good news. We give them the truth. That's love, when you give somebody the truth. But like Tim Hague says, he says, in our modern times, the culture in which we live uh, is moved far beyond compromising to the postmodern mantra that every viewpoint has value and must be accepted. But the scriptures quite obviously speak against such modernity. For what is of God is marked as clearly opposed to that which is contrary to his righteousness. In short, what John so clearly teaches us here is that false teachers and their false teaching stand in opposition to the truth of God, and we are to recognize the distinctions and act accordingly. So false teachers, their ideology, won't, won't you accept us? Well, oh, we don't want to get saved. We, could, we, don't, we just want you to accept us. No, they, they are prohibited from entering our, our congregation. They have no place here in our congregation. They have no place, no platform to spread their heresies and their ideology and their theologies. No, they have no place here. Head continues. A final application of John's admonition in this verse. His strong words warning us not to accept false teachers as though they were actually members of God's family through faith in Yeshua's need to be applied in our digital internet world where untold numbers of false teachers are peddling their false teachings all dressed up in attractive garb and promising success and even wealth to those who follow their errant instructions. Never before has there been such a robust, easily utilized method for disseminating teachings, and this means that the people of God must be all the more diligent to test all things against the unchanging standard of God's Word. This also means that we must know our Bible and be able to detect anything in that which we read or hear which is at variance with the truth revealed to us by God. It is vitally important, if I may add to that, you read and study your Bible so that when someone does teach you something, when you do hear something, immediately, it's, it does it pass the smell test? Are there red flags going up? MacArthur writes, John's prohibition is not a case of entertaining people who disagree on minor matters. These false teachers were carrying on a regular campaign to destroy the basic fundamental truths of Christianity. Complete disassociation from such heretics is the only appropriate course of action for genuine believers. No benefit or aid of any type, not even a greeting, is permissible. Believers should aid only those who proclaim the truth. End quote. <laughs> don't, you don't even greet people like that. They're the enemy. They're doing Satan's work. They're taking our blessed Lord and Savior and lying about him. No, no. You, you get no greeting and you get no support. You don't even walk in the door. You don't deserve to be here. For the one who gives them a greeting, John says, participates in his evil deeds. Obviously, now, the greeting that John is referring to, he's not talking about shaking hands or saying hello. He's talking about when you accommodate or offer encouraging words to a false teacher, you are participating in their deeds. You're giving them a platform. You think of that word participate, it means to have a close association together, or to have fellowship with. And so, yes, yes, search out the false teachers. Absolutely. And there are plenty of them on the Internet, plenty of false teachers. And so, yes, listen to them. Watch their teachings. Take notes. Critique. Right? Read, read what they have. And then guess what? Warn others. You warn others. Listen, that teacher there, that teacher there, that teacher there, they're teaching heresies. And you expose them. That's our job. That's what, we're, what we've been called to do. We've been called to be light. Light shines and it removes the darkness. We expose the darkness. That's our responsibility. Aiken continues. He says, John says there is to be no encouragement whatsoever. 
showing hospitality or verbal agreement would be to participate in their evil work. Although there is to be no rudeness on the part of a believer, neither is there to be the slightest encouragement to those teachers who spread the cancer of false teaching. The issue of truth is crucial. It must be preserved at all costs. To act in any other manner would be to invite spiritual suicide. End quote. S.S. Smalley, he writes, John is not therefore forbidding private hospitality, but rather an official welcome into the congregation with the widespread opportunities which would then be available for the heretics to promote their cause. So, we, we, <laughs> the gospel is an offense. We all understand that. All right. We are not to be offensive because the gospel is already an offense. We are to present it as clearly as we can, as boldly as we, cl as we can, and, and without apology. When, when you have false teachers that are spreading lies and heresies, we expose them. And don't apologize for doing so. Don't apologize. Guzik comments, he says, We are defined by what we reject as much as what we accept. In this, some are so open-minded that they are empty-headed. It is wise to keep an open mind on many things, but one would never keep an open mind about which poisons a person what, what he might try. You might say yes to all the right things, but one must also say no to what is false and evil. We need to become good at rejecting what should be rejected. In the late 19th century, the rise of theological liberalism brought forth generations of Christian pastors, leaders, and theologians who denied many of the fundamentals of biblical Christianity. Though it was a broad and varied movement, at the root, theological liberalism thought that Christianity had to reevaluate all its doctrines in the light of modern science, philosophy, and thinking. They rejected the idea that a doctrine was true simply because the Bible taught it. It also had to be proved true by reason and experience. They believed that the Bible was not an inspired message from a real God, but the work of men who were limited by the ignorance and superstitions of their time. For them, the Bible was not either inspired or supernatural. The importance of the Bible and its message was not in its literal or historical truth, but in its changing spiritual message. And that happened. As he said, late in the 19th century, if you look at the West, that's when all, really, it was one cult after another cult, after another cult, after another cult. And it was all within about a 50-year period. You had Jehovah's Witness, you had Mormonism, you had uh, Christian Science, uh, you had... Uh, Seventh-day Advent, all of that came within about a 50-year period in the West. And that's just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So now he's rounding out his, his letter, verse number 12, though I have many things to write to you. I do not want you to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made full. I think, I think we all understand where John's going. At some point, you've got to wrap it up. And he said, listen, I, instead of, you know, sending you an email or typing this thing out or a text message or, you know what, hey, let's sit down and have a face-to-face. -face. Okay, let's have a talk. There's no indication as to the community he was writing or to the distance he needed to travel. He doesn't say so. He does mention paper and ink paper, of course, would have been a papyrus sheet. And in that day, the papyrus sheet would have been large enough to have written this entire epistle on. So it's probably one sheet. The ink refers to a mixture of water, coal, and gum resin that was used to write with. Verse number 13, the children of your chosen sister greet you. That's his conclusion. And if, if you remember at the beginning of, of our uh, uh, lesson here in Second John, we asked the question, was he writing to an individual or was he writing to a community? And I think with this final 13th verse, I think it's pretty clear that he was writing to a community. It seems rather clear. Uh, he's writing to a congregation and not an individual. Notice he says, the children of your chosen sister. So it certainly appears he's referring to the assembly from which he's writing. 
Final words from uh, a couple commentators here for you. Haig writes in his commentary, he says, John ends this short epistle by reminding his readers and us that our life in the Messiah was initiated by God through his gracious and sovereign love. It is when we are constantly reminded that we belong to him and that as a result, he is also ours, that we are strengthened in our faith to live for the goal of sanctifying his name in our world. Gary Burge writes, last words, I am reminded again and again in John's letters that there is one central theological doctrine that overshadows all else. We have life only through Jesus Christ, God's Son, who truly became one of us for our salvation. This much is obvious. But voices constantly arise in our own culture that would like to dilute the exclusive and offensive nature of that message. For some, Jesus Christ is one more problem that makes genuine union among the religions of the world impossible. For others, the incarnation and death of Jesus is one more embarrassment that harks back to an archaic day when crosses and sacrifice meant something. For still others, Jesus Christ is one more offense that promotes a patriarchal system of abuse that in the modern world we must purge. My point is this. We will experience a pressure to dilute the message of Christ that is no different from the pressure faced by the Johannine world. John's followers felt acute pressure from the sophisticated halls of Hellenistic academia, not to mention the popular voices of the marketplace, to reduce the person of Christ into someone less than he was. John calls his followers to stand firm, and he would have us to do the same. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for the inerrancy of your word. We thank you, Lord, for preserving this wonderful letter that we have been had, had the privilege of reading and studying and conversing about. And Lord, we do. We, 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 pick, up the, we pick up the banner. We take up the cross. And we proclaim the name that is above all other names. And there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Lord, that is a message that is, uh, is very offensive in a world of postmodernism, uh, in a world of universalism, where the message is very clear, He is the only way. He is the only way, and there is no other way. And there is no other prophet. And there is no other religion. There's only Him. And His name is Yeshua, and He's our salvation. Lord, I pray that this letter uh, would strengthen us and give us encouragement and a boldness to proclaim that good news. And Lord, as well, is that we take a, a, the responsibility of exposing the darkness, of finding those false teachings and those false teachers and exposing them. But not in a, in a vindictive kind of way, but rather in a loving way because their teachings are dragging people into eternal hellfire. Lord, may we take up the cause. May we expose those false teachers and those false teachings and bring people and, and uh, direct people to your salvation, which is the only salvation and the only good news. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers as well as answering them. And we pray them all in Yeshua's precious name. Amen.